Hi, it's uh, Glenn McKnight, a member of the DC Coalition of Schools of Internet Governance. And this is part of our series of recordings of all the schools of uh, uh, internet governance. And what we have as our guest today is Wolfgang and Sandra. And uh, as you all know, I, everyone has uh, shared their experiences the last couple of years because of COVID-19. But I think it's really critical to get Wolfgang and Sandra's perspective because uh, as they will indicate, they were the first. In being the first, they have a long history of why they do what they do and its impact. And I think it's uh, a very important part of what we're trying to do here is to tell the story. And the story here is the importance of schools of internet governance and how it impacts the end users. So I'm gonna turn it over to both of you and welcome and uh, over to you to tell your story. Um, thank you, Ken. And, um, you know, in, uh, when we start the um, uh, opening session in Meissen, our summer school, which has now already 15 years, uh, I tell the story, you know, from the World Summit on the Information Society, when China and the US could not agree in the first phase how to govern the internet. And Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and this time uh, was asked to establish a working group on internet governance, uh, the mm. acronym was WIGIG, and to help him how to bridge the divide. And because at this time, nobody knew really what the internet governance is. Uh, I was uh, an academic member, so the beauty of this uh, UN working group was that it was a multi-stakeholder group, not normally in the UN they have intergovernmental groups, but here um, this was for the first time in the history of the United Nations, that they established a multi-stakeholder working group. And while we had 50% uh, uh, from government, the other 50% came from the non-state uh, actors. And uh, governmental people at this time had only little knowledge about the internet. So uh, they had neither technical knowledge nor you know, the, they understood the implications. And so uh, as an academic member of the community, I was approached by many uh, governmental members of the WIGI, and they asked me you know, where we can study internet governance. So, and the answer was nowhere, because uh, normally universities are organized around faculties, which represent certain disciplines. You can study law, you can study political science, informatics, uh, cultural science, economy. So uh, this is the way how uh, teaching in an academic environment takes place. And, uh, but the internet and internet governance is a multidisciplinary issue. It's a little bit law, it's a little bit informatics, it's a little bit economics, political science, but it means you have to study everything if you want to get uh, the full picture. And so, and this was certainly an answer which was not satisfactory, neither for the governmental people who wanted to get more knowledge, nor for the academics in the, in the working group. And you know there were some academics, including Peng Shua from uh, University in uh, Singapore, and Technology University in Singapore, and we discussed already during uh, the wicked time, you know, that we have to do something yeah. as an academic community. We cannot wait until you know deans or faculty say, okay, we have to broaden our approach to. Uh, 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 to uh, these new challenges. Uh, and in 2004 5, internet was still seen as a new challenge, as, as a subject which is elsewhere in the, in the, in, in the world. So, um, Peng Shua at this time from Singapore, he was the president of the International Communication Association, ICA, uh, which is a huge uh, global network of communication researcher. And I myself was the uh, president of the law section of the International Association for Media and Communication Research, INCR. And, you know, the, uh, I say, uh, both organizations have um, uh, annual world uh, congresses and both operate uh, in an agreement with UNESCO as the main uh, UN organizations for science and uh, education and information and communication. So uh, the um, uh, the, 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 the interesting point was that uh, the ICA had its annual congress in the year 2006 in Germany, in Dresden, 
and I'm from Germany. Dresden is close to my hometown. So I uh, said to Peng Shuai, you know, why not to organize a, a pre-event, something like a day zero event before this World Congress, which brings together thousands of academic researchers from the world. And so we organized in a village a little bit outside from Dresden uh, a three-day pre-conference to the ICA meeting. And you know, during this meeting, we discussed two things that we need a new network for research, for academic research and internet governance, and we need a new network for education. And so the uh, concrete uh, proposal for research was the establishment uh, of a global internet governance academic network, which is known now as GigaNet, which has an annual meeting uh, at the eve of the IGF, and it's a well-established new network with uh, thousands of researchers from around the globe. Uh, when we discuss the education, you know, how to promote education internet governance, uh, we, uh, we are rather realistic and said, you know, it will be impossible to create a global academy for internet governance. Also, you know, who would pay for this and how to organize it on a global level. So the idea was why not to have on a regional level, or at least on the national level, you know, uh, uh, something like a summer school, not to have a new university or an academy. So a summer school in Europe, it's very popular. And we said, okay, then let's recommend, you know, to um, uh, develop um, a, a one-week course uh, on a master's level, which would give, really produce all the multidisciplinary knowledge which is needed to understand internet governance and the political, economic, legal, and other implications. So, and you know, being in there in Dresden, so I said, okay, I I do the pilot project, and so we moved in 2007 to this old monastery in Meissen, and mm -hmm. said, you know, because this is a place. And the beauty of the place is that it's from the Middle Ages, and this was the school for the father of the German Enlightenment. This is Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. So, and I think that this is wonderful. So, because what we need now is a new wave of enlightenment in this uh, digital world. And so, we link the past with this uh, old monastery to the challenges of the future in Meissen. And so, and this was the pilot project. And uh, this was a great success in 2007. So we developed really a curriculum uh, according to the standards of the uh, uh, EU uh, Bologna process, you know, which has a certain credit system for a master course. And uh, so where we identified, you know, what are the needed knowledge for a person who is active in this internet governance field in policy making and ICANN and IGF in other diplomatic negotiations. And while Olga was uh, among the faculty members, so we uh, discovered there that there are two summers on the globe, one in the north, one in the south, so in different. And so I encouraged uh, Olga and say, you know, why not to have a south school on internet governance? Okay. So that we have in, 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 in the European summer, we have it in the, on, in the north, and then in February, March in the south, because there, there is a need and, and, and a request to become a fellow, you know, exploded. We had immediately after the first announcement more than 100 uh, applications and uh, the same happened uh, with Olga. So this was the, the start of the beginning. And then we uh, moved forward, you know, year by year and uh, improved the program and tried to inspire others, you know, to follow the example. And this is after a couple of years, we had the idea to create an, an, an uh, international uh, mechanism for school of internet governance and being involved in the, in the IGF. My idea was why not to use the established mechanisms of dynamic coalitions and to have a network for all these uh, summer schools which emerged since 2007 and to create the dynamic coalitions. And here we are now. I think it's a, it's a great achievement after 15 years that we have now I think more than 20 uh, national and regional summer schools. So more or less it followed the development of the IGF with national and regional IGFs. And what I see is there is even a greater uh, need 
uh, for policymakers, for civil society activists, for business leaders um, to enhance their understanding of internet governance. And the complexity of the issue did not uh, disappear since 2005. And my impression is it's even more complex than it was uh, 2005. So uh, that's why I use the terminology or the language of the new complexity of the uh, internet governance ecosystem. So more has to be done. And our experiences are um, uh, available for everybody. And fortunately, uh, we had Sandra from the early beginning as the project manager for this. And she did not only do all the practical work, how to organize a summer school with 25 faculty members and 30 fellows. So it's a big thing to organize travel and to do all this. But you know, over the years, uh, um, you know, this has been uh, developed to a uh, rather uh, perfect uh, mechanism, which um, is still, uh, or, or which continues to be attractive for people from around the globe. One final point is that this was from the early beginning, a community uh, project. So that means we had no uh, governmental money involved. So that means uh, we, uh, I went around and asked the constituencies, primarily from ICANN, but then also from the broader internet a governance community to make small contributions. And that's why we have 20 plus or 30 uh, various sponsors. So which can sponsor either fellows to participate in the meeting or can make uh, uh, in cash contributions so that we can organize uh, uh, all this. And uh, another basic principle was also that we uh, have not just, you know, normally summer schools work with two or three professors. So we wanted to have a multi-stakeholder faculty. So to bring the people uh, to the fellows who do the job so that, uh, that they have the legitimacy and credibility. To management about domain name management. So that means if people who are doing this, if very science speaks about domain management, if RIPE NCC speaks about uh, IP address management, so then fellows understand, okay, this is uh, uh, the source of all the problems. Certainly professors can speak about all this, uh, but um, uh, our approach was, you know, to bring the people who are doing the job into a faculty position so that they can tell the story uh, to the fellows and they understand it uh, much better. And this includes also that we have more than just the lectures. So that means the, the uh, faculty fellow communication in the coffee break over the dinner uh, and, and social events or on the breakfast table is as important as the lectures. So uh, I always say, you know, if students arrive in my school, you start internet governance uh, discussion at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning, and you end two o'clock in the night when you sit around the glass of wine on the terrace of this old uh, monastery. So it's much more than the six or eight hours lecture today. So this is in short uh, what we have done, how we have started, and probably uh, Sandra can add something uh, about you know how this has been organized and uh, will be future developed because uh, more or less Santa is now the, the key player for the future. The things if we discuss about the future, so uh, uh, Santa will uh, uh, take over a lot of these uh, functions. Back to you, Clem. Thank you. Great, Sandra. Did you want to add something to that? I have a, a couple of questions to go into, but I want to give you a chance to to jump in in case Wolfgang forgot something. No, um, thank you, Glenn. Wolfgang didn't really forget anything. And I would like to say I share his enthusiasm and possibly everyone feels the enthusiasm when he speaks about his project. And uh, we, I think speaking for both of us, we can really say that's a project of our heart or very close to our heart. It's always such a pleasure to welcome uh, participants from all over the world in Meissen. And what you see here in this uh, picture is basically the terrace um, ah. that uh, we are sitting usually on uh, late at night discussing internet governance. And uh, with my uh, background screen, I wanted to give an impression about the specific atmosphere of our monastery and why it's so special to, to come to Meissen in, in this regard. And um, <clears throat> as Wolfgang said, <coughs> Over the years, the program um, 
was developed, but in fact, it hasn't changed dramatically. I mean, mm. the history is still the history. <coughs> Apologies. So this is the uh, usually opening of our school. But then um, we experimented with some elements. In the early days, we had student presentation, asking them uh, to present uh, some case studies, some facts and figures from their countries. Right. Um, later on, we uh, um, took over that uh, um, that multi-stakeholder uh, um, multi-stakeholder practicum that Afri Doria has invented, and I think uh, the first time she was doing it was at the uh, African School on Internet Governance, and uh, we uh, found that was a very good idea, and we tried it here as well, and it was basically a really really good thing to do. Um, we had to stop it a little bit due to the Corona pandemic um, and changed our program to make uh, everything a little bit more um, uh, keeping people on, a, on, on distance and uh, not having too, too many hours in, in closed rooms. And that would have been a contradiction to the practicum where our fellows were really asked to um, negotiate like in the real world and uh, these negotiations as in international forums. You notice they can continue until late at night, and as it was the same in Meissen, uh, fellows were sitting in the uh, room, and not only fellows, also the faculty um, were sitting in our uh, main lecture room, negotiating, uh, stepping into the shoes of governmental experts, of technical experts, or civil society, fighting for the right solution. And this was all done on a very practical uh, matter that was uh, on top of the agenda of, of each year. But um, I stop here and Glenn, uh, give back to you because I'm sure you have some specific questions to ask. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. There, there's a lot of, lot of uh, issues and, and, and ideas are flooding to my head at the same time. Uh, the one thing that, that I'm impressed with is you guys take the concept of internet governance rather than just the generalities you're actually changing lives of these individuals and and i'm sure the faculty as well but on the fellows so so my impression is they um they just can't sit there passively they have to go through an exercise they have to put themselves into the shoes of policymakers in their own country um can you tell a story and you don't have to say a name of anyone but where they've taken this course they've 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 learned to think differently uh, and they're somewhat maybe marginally or directly involved with internet governance where they went back and actually applied many of the learnings that they got from Meissen. Uh, I think so. Let's come back to the role play uh, as Antra mentioned. So we, uh, we are very, um, uh, let's say, engaged in picking the right topic. So that means what is the topic of the year? So uh, when we had the negotiations in the United Nations um, eight years ago about the extension of the mandate of the IGF, of the Internet Governance Forum. So this was the subject for the discussion before they had the final discussions in New York. So that means that people played in the room, you know, how to <laughs> negotiate a resolution which would extend the mandate for the IGF. So when we had the Yana transition, so before the Yana transition was completed in 2016, uh, we had all the conflicts around the Yana transition, you know, on the uh, on our Meissen negotiation table. So that people took a role and said, "I represent the U.S. government, I represent uh, uh, the, the the Russian government or the ITU or somebody else. I'm from the private sector. I'm civil society." And so we played. You know, we mirror more or less what happens in the real world. Right. And, and, and this has uh, uh, was a tremendous opportunity. That's why we were sitting until two o'clock in the morning, you know, with experienced negotiator in the uh, role of the chairman or the rapporteur. So Fiona Alexander who, uh, from the U.S. Uh, uh, Department of Commerce, who was in many, many U.N. negotiations, you know, was the mm -hmm. rapporteur of the meeting or, right. you know, uh, uh, some other people who had this practical experience and know, you know, how you had debates uh, organized, how they, so, and this was a great experience where we uh, distributed in the role. So somebody was, that we have working groups and co-chairs and, and, and sub-rapporteurs 
So the, the same system which happens in the real world was played there. And then it's difficult to get an agreement if somebody two o'clock says, you know, I from the Chinese government cannot agree with this text. You know, I want to have a different language in paragraph 7.2. So this was very real and it worked and people were very enthusiastic about it. Mm. And so the uh, when you ask, you know, did this change the life of fellows? So we have around four or 500 fellows. So we have still a list and uh, it's if you go through this list, it's really impressive. So how many uh, names which are now well known, yeah. you know, were in my scene panel 12 or 15 years ago. And so certainly you can say, you know, um, uh, this was the starting point. So Andrea Glorioso, who became then the uh, liaison of the European Union uh, in the ambassy in, uh, embassy in, in Washington. So uh, this was a rather high political function. Renalia became an uh, ICANN board member. Uh, and uh, so that means many uh, uh, fellows um, you know, took this and this was the feedback we got also that some people said, okay, you opened my eyes because I was thinking on internet in a, let's say in a one uh, disciplinary approach and I realized, okay, this is much bigger and here we have a lot of gaps and, and a lot of uh, these fellows used the opportunity and uh, I would not say to start a new career because uh, Meissen was also, let's say, an, an input, a push. And then, you know, if you are a good person, you will take your own way and, 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 and you get input from elsewhere. So it's not only Meissen, but for many people, what I have heard in the last 10, 15 years, well, if, if I meet them, you know, I said, this was the starting point, you know. One of our success stories was uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, a, a girl or you know, a young lady, which came from Burkina Faso uh, to the summer school. I think it was in one of the first summer schools. And when I was in an ITU meeting in Geneva, you know, I uh, went to a lift and uh, suddenly, you know, uh, a, a lady, a very elegant lady, uh, met me in the lift and said, oh, Wolfgang, you know, do you remember my scene? So, and I said, you know, you cannot remember all the fellows. So, but uh, when we went to the conference hall, she went to the podium, uh, I went to the audience, and she was introduced as the Minister of Communication for Burkina Faso. So I think this was, and, and then she said, okay, this was an eye opener for me and the starting point for uh, something which can be described as a career. So, and you have a lot of this, uh, and, and uh, our understanding is we try to help people to find their own way. Right. So that means we do not push them, we do not uh, brainwash them, we just, uh, our understanding is to enable uh, uh, the, the fellows to find their own way. I think this enabling philosophy is mm -hmm. uh, behind our concept in Muslim. Perfect. I think Sandra wants to share her screen. I gave you access, uh, Sandra. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. And just to underline what Wolfgang has just said about the numbers, um, if anyone has an interest, you can have a look on our website where we uh, basically pull together the fellows uh, group by stakeholder, group by gender, and also by geographical uh, region. So you will basically see that even the name suggests to be a, a, a regional school of Europe. It's basically not the case. We are definitely an international school because we had fellows from places like Wanautu and uh, Africa, Latin America elsewhere. And that basically makes it um, such an interesting approach that you have the entire world. And um, to the point of uh, how did it change people's life, please mm. let me add we got uh, four couples uh, formed in Meissen and three of them are meanwhile married. And this is something which is really, uh, I think, a very, a very nice outcome of, of our school. Maybe it had something to do with the wine, maybe. You think? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, so you're, you're right, um, oh, Wolfgang, when you said that you, you're, um, you're not imposing the... the um, the educational uh, framework, they basically have to find their own path. And, and again, if somebody is, is really passionate about um, the subject, as we all know, 
internet governance is pretty broad. Like it, it covers so many different topics and, and it's almost impossible to be an expert in, in every field. And, but uh, so my, we're, we're talking a long history here. We're talking 15 years. You're talking four or 500 fellows. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. 500 fellows. Um, and, and, and what I, what I find is quite interesting is you're not taking anyone and, and maybe you can drill down a little bit on your fellows. You're saying you, you target the policymakers, the business leaders, uh, people who are, can make a difference in their own country. Uh, so can you, what, can you maybe elaborate a little bit for people who might be interested in applying for a fellowship? So maybe you can t- elaborate on the criteria that you use in order to select those uh, fellows. Yeah, I think the first thing uh, is that we do, uh, our target group are not undergraduates. We are looking for people who are, have already made a certain career, so the people in their uh, early 30s uh, okay. who have already uh, uh, something uh, experienced either in the practical world, in the academic world, or elsewhere. So I had long discussion with Jovan uh, Korbelia, who does Diplo Foundation courses, and Jovan was part of our faculty, and we had also a good relationship. And more or less the understanding was Diplo does the uh, bachelor course, and we do the master course. So that means we expect if people come to Meissen, and if they apply for it, that they have already achieved something. So we are looking, uh, uh, we are not interested in the undergraduates who uh, have to understand the basics. So we, are, our expectation is that they have already a certain level so that we can build on this. So this is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, our slogan is learning in a multi-stakeholder environment. So that means if we um, reach out to fellows, uh, we want to have a right mix in uh, the group in Meissen. So that we have uh, fellows, you know, from government, from private sector, uh, from the technical community, from civil society, academic uh, people or uh, others. So it's not only the regional diversity or the uh, gender balance, so it's also, you know, this background balance. Uh, and, 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 and I think this is important because when I mentioned the faculty fellow communication on the terrace, so even uh, uh, the fellow fellow communication, sometimes it's more important. So in the last summer school, we had an, uh, a person who is new in the Dutch government who came to the summer school. And so she met a lot of civil society activists from Africa. And because he is engaged in a development policy in the Dutch Ministry for Economics. And so this was a unique opportunity for her so in the fellow fellow communication. They have a civil society person from Africa, right. a governmental person from Europe. And this is multi-stakeholder communication uh, in, in practice. So mm-hmm. and in so far to, 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 to create the right balance in the group of fellows. So this is really important. This is one of the uh, admirable work uh, Santa is doing because she has long lists and tries to find uh, then the right balance. So that we, uh, that's why we are very careful and we are in a lucky position that we have enough applications so that we can create such a group, uh, which uh, is uh, indeed a multi-stakeholder. And uh, it's also, you know, that we try to have a certain age balance. If you have some people in their 40s, so this is also good, you know, and if you have some people in their 20s, so that means uh, age plays a role in uh, because we have various generations in internet governance, so the old veterans and now the newcomers, and it's good if on the fellow side, you know, they are not get uh, the, the information from the, let's say, the old professors, but uh, also from uh, their, their neighbors uh, uh, in, the, in the group of fellows. And so, so on the opposite side, the faculty, how do you get your faculty and, and do you have repeat faculty coming year after year and they actually uh, try to emphasize a particular aspect of the curriculum? Um, Glenn and Wolfgang, may I please interrupt you because I think the question on the fellowship was not really answered. Okay, go ahead. And I think that's an important aspect of of our school and any school in particular. Wolfgang elaborated a lot on the uh, multi-stakeholder 
nature, not only of the faculty, but also of the fellows. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, we do offer certain um, opportunities to apply for a fellowship that can be a fellowship uh, that covers the costs for the school only, that can be a fellowship that covers the costs for the school and the travel, or that can be a reduced fee for university students or for people from emerging economies. But for a very good reason, we also offer uh, no fellowship, but offer uh, to pay the full participation fee. Because you achieve only stakeholder balance if you invite people that are able and willing to pay and people that are not able and able to pay for such a course. And uh, I think this is uh, a little bit um, or sometimes underestimated, but I believe that is really very important because, you, for instance, governmental people, they expect or they, at least in Europe, they expect to pay for something like this. They are not even allowed to take this for granted because it involves sponsorship money. So therefore, we have to offer an opportunity for those people uh, to, to pay the, the full participation fee. But as Wolfgang rightly said, this gives the opportunity for uh, governmental people from, uh, he mentioned uh, the Dutch government, to meet uh, civil society activists from, from Africa. Otherwise, you would not bring those people together. And that's the reason why we have such a broad range of participation opportunities, fellowships on the one hand, yes, they are important, and paying fellows on the other hand. And uh, we like to achieve that we always have sort of a 50-50 um, uh, mixture in, in our course so that we he have here a stakeholder balance as well, also between uh, emerging countries and um, more, more developed and, and uh, stronger countries. That's, that's what I, that was important to me. And uh, I think that uh, should be added. So oh, back to you, Glenn. Yeah, I, I, before I go back to the faculty question, um, my comment on the fellowship, and I think you're, you're quite right on your approach in terms of the uh, looking for that happy balance and, and the financial aspects is, is part of the criteria. Uh, just on the fellowship, is there any countries that are underrepresented in terms of, I saw your pie graph earlier, uh, and there's very little from North America actually uh, comparing, uh, but population is lower. So is there any areas in the world that actually you think uh, should be applying that have not not stepped up and sent someone? Mm. Let me put it that way. Um, we always have uh, an easy task to get people from, uh, people from, uh, from Europe. That's easy. Um, in Africa, um, we have a lot of applications, but um, we don't have too many uh, sponsors that support the travel from Africa that right. can be quite costly. The same applies to Latin America. And the most difficult part basically is the uh, Asia Pacific room and here in particular the Pacific. We had people from uh, Fiji or from Vanuatu, um, but for them, of course, most challenging to, to, mm. to arrive. But um, since we have now also schools of this kind in the Asia Pacific region, I think they are pretty well served. Nevertheless, we of course want to have, uh, in order to represent the, the global community, we, we are very much interested also in applications from, from this region. And North America, um, let me put it that way, there are not too many, but it's, it's, it's also not, I wouldn't call it underrepresented. Um, okay. That's, that's um, pretty much okay, because in particular, um, between Europe and, and North America, there is an exchange for, for students anyway. So right. once they are here in the region, um, it's an easy task for them to uh, apply for such a course in, in Europe. And, and what about the marginalized groups such as refugees or uh, Romani or, or gypsies or indigenous groups? Uh, or do you make a point of reaching out to those groups? Um, we had indeed one fellow, and that was in the very early days, who uh, was just immigrating and, and was forced to, to stay in, in Germany for a while. And we just offered him the course in order to bridge the time in a meaningful manner. But um, to be honest, it is not so easy to reach those groups because as right. Wolfgang said, we, we are looking, or this course is designed for, uh, for fellows that are already doing the PhD. Okay. And uh, so this is basically the, um, the, 
the, the, the target group that we are looking for. And this does not really um, allow to an outreach to, to, to migrants or, or you, you know what I mean? I mean, if you contact those, we, we are contacting universities and we are not looking, is there a migrant or is there a not, not non-migrated person? We are looking for the qualification rather than, and if this is a, a person from a, a region, for instance, when, when the war is still going on, we had fellows from Yemen, of course it was uh, very important for us to support those people that have less opportunities in their countries at the moment. So yes, if we get those people, they indeed have a little bit of priority on our list. Okay, great. I think that's, that, that's quite helpful. Let's turn back to the faculty issue. Uh, can you say about how did you select the faculty? Is a repeat faculty? Do certain faculties have you know, one or two focuses and that's it. And they do the same, same concept year upon year. So can you talk about the, the faculty approach and how do you select a, the faculty? Yes, uh, Glenn, as I said earlier, uh, our concept from the early beginning was that it's not a place that uh, a handful of professors tell a group of students, you know, how the world uh, is organized and the internet world is organized. So uh, our concept from the early beginning was to bring the people into the faculty who do the real job. Uh, and certainly you need a, a group of academic persons who, uh, because it's a school and a school with, uh, you know, which has a certain ambition to uh, deliver knowledge, which is uh, on a master's level. So, but on the other hand, we said we need people from the business sector, from civil society organizations, from governments to just tell the fellows what they are doing. So that means the, uh, the faculty is also very stakeholder. Coming back to the history, certainly it was the people from the beginning uh, who were very involved in the business process and in ICANN. Uh, academic, there was a lot of academic persons there, you know, from Milton to Bill Twake uh, to Peng Shua and others. Uh, so this was the core group who said, okay, now uh, our knowledge so, um, can be uh, delivered uh, to the fellows. So we have now a place where we can, you know, uh, describe uh, uh, to fellows what we have written in our books. So, and, uh, and, and then we have developed over the years a system where we say we have some core lectures which are given by classical academics. So on, on basic issues. So that's about the history. Uh, this is what I'm doing. It's about you know, the policy frameworks, that is, uh, what Milton and Bill Twake are doing. This is about standards and protocols. This is what Avri is doing. So that means, uh, and, and this is about philosophy. This is what Bertrand de la Chapelle is doing. So that means we have some classical key lectures. Um, economy is done by, by Pepper, uh, who was with Cisco in the Aspen Institute and is now with Facebook. So that means we had a number of uh, uh, what we call the key lectures, the big lecture. So, and then uh, uh, on, the, on the other level, we have done, uh, you know, smaller presentations by the practitioners. For instance, if we, and we have structured uh, the whole five uh, days into the uh, uh, policy day, the business day, the tech day, uh, the, the forward-looking future day. So, and then we will we fill slots, you know, on this day. If we come to the tech day, then we say, okay, we have to have somebody in the faculty who manages a root server. So it was either Keith Tracek from Verisign or last year because Keith couldn't travel, you know, it's Wipe NCC which managed the root server. Then we invite managers from CCTLDs. We had a broad range because a lot of CCTLDs also supported fellows or, you know, our general supporters like Denik as the main supporter from Germany, Nick Ate from Austria, Switch from Switzerland. Uh, we had Urit, we had Sira from Canada, By uh, Byron Holland was uh, several times also a member of the faculty. Uh, so uh, we had now Chris de Spain who was also uh, there. So that means we are looking for people who are doing the job and if they speak about CCTLD management, GTLD management, uh, about ISPs, role of ISPs, so then uh, this is a higher level of credibility and legitimacy if they transfer the knowledge and not uh, uh, classical academic professors. So 
So, and then uh, we have the policy people. So that means we are trying to get uh, some uh, governmental people or members of the CAC uh, and, and just say, you know, what is the governmental approach? And in the business day, we try to reach out to uh, people who are, you know, the big players in the internet world. So <laughs> really we are very proud that I think a couple of years ago, we were able to have Amazon and Alibaba in one time on, wow. on economy wow. in, in the summer school, because wow. this is what uh, fellows are interested to see, okay, what um, uh, at and what uh, a Verizon, a British Telecom, what German uh, uh, is, is doing in this field, what Facebook, what Google is doing in this field. So Google of, uh, also, you know, for many, many years, when is a great supporter uh, of the uh, summer school. And so we had also, you know, uh, Facebook uh, and, and, and other big players. I think this is what uh, fellows uh, want to know. They want to get a perspective. And my um, recommendations to the fellows is always, do not expect a final answer to your question. But the internet has no final answer. It can have different perspectives. And this is what we want to deliver, different perspectives. So you have the perspective, and, and that's the multi-stakeholder system. You have the governmental perspective, you have the business perspective, you have the perspective from the technical community, and certainly civil society. We had Amnesty International, uh, we had uh, Human Rights Watch, we had uh, APC, Andriette is always you know, a faculty member. Uh, of us, so that uh, the, the fellows get the various perspectives. And then if they go home, if they go home, they can then make their own uh, conclusion from this. Mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. That's why, you know, again, uh, this is not, you know, brainwashing uh, summer school. This is really an enabling school, which enables uh, uh, qualified people to get a broader understanding of the uh, of the complexity uh, of the internet governance ecosystem. Uh, I think it a, an absolute good grounding in, in what you just mentioned to me. Uh, technically, um, do, is, is there any uh, compiled notes that are shared with the group or is there any recordings of, of the sessions? How do they retain the, the, because it seems to me that they get a lot of stuff thrown at them over the length of time they're there, how do they uh, how do they retain it? Do they have a uh, some some kind of document or recording that they can go back and look at and, and refresh their their memories? Um, let me take that question. Um, for a good reason, this summer school in Meisen is a little bit I wouldn't call it Chatham House rules, but it should a little bit uh, warrant the uh, what has been discussed in Meisen within this. Uh, bricks or walls it's, of this it's stays in. Okay. And we had, for instance, uh, faculty members uh, from certain countries that said, "I don't want to be my pub I don't want to have my presentation to be public." Okay. And um, uh, I think if you want to really have an in-depth and honest discussion, sometimes it's better to be not on the record. Sure. And um, this is also why we design the, answer, the, the question uh, on uh, remote participation, because we believe this course is really something that you can only do in person. And I'm speaking from our course. I know that uh, you, Glenn, you are doing a virtual school, but you have a different concept and it's made and it's designed for being virtual. Ours is totally designed for uh, in-person uh, interaction. And... Um, what people uh, or what, what fellows get um, to take home, we have the presentations online, but even those are passport protected because also the faculty sometimes say, this is our Soleil knowledge, this is our private knowledge. I get paid as a professor at a university. I cannot just give it out for free uh, like this. Okay. And this of course also uh, um, is sort of, uh, um, justifying the course fee that, that we take. So, and, and also uh, to have a little bit of uh, exclusivity is, is sometimes good because what, what, when I speak to, to uh, colleagues from that doing other conferences, they never understand why everything in internet governance conferences, I can meetings whatsoever is free of charge. And there is, let's be honest, there is a notion outside uh, what, 
uh, something that costs nothing is nothing worth. Of course, we know that's wrong. But um, some, sometimes uh, you can only convince people to participate if it's a little bit exclusive and if it's uh, also asking for a participation fee. And in order to reach out to those new communities that have no clue about internet mm -hmm. governance, but that are for the future also in the need of gaining such knowledge, we also should uh, warrant these kind of uh, um, measures. Okay, that, 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 that makes sense. the reason I, I can let me add here, because this is an important point. This is one reason why we have the fellowship program. Because we do not want that the price is a barrier for people who cannot afford it. Right. So we have an exclu a certain exclusivity. That's right. Our slogan is teaching the internet governance leaders of tomorrow. So right. this is uh, certainly exclusive. But we do uh, not want to, to have this as a barrier for an exclusive group. That's why we have more than 50% uh, of the uh, fellows that are based on fellowships in the two categories. Uh, either they get the full fellowship, it includes travel costs, or that they just are, have nothing to pay for their one week stay, uh, including accommodation, all these social events and so, and so on. So, this is, but here we have so-called a competition. That means we have to look then for the application. It's like in the nomcom that we are sitting, you know, and discussing who is first uh, that we can give and the fellowship community. So that's not that it comes from elsewhere. And we very often uh, uh, discuss with the uh, uh, community with uh, uh, people who. Uh, contribute to the fellowship program that they say okay you should know where your money goes this goes to this fellow so that as I said you build a relationship between the sponsor and the fellow and uh, I think this is uh, and, and, and uh, also part of the strategy that we want to be uh, exclusive but want to be also uh, not erect barriers for people who cannot afford it. And I can tell you, we had a, also with the Council of Europe, a good relationship to bring people from the uh, former uh, Soviet Republic from Asia. Uh, we had people from the Ukraine long before the whole battle on Ukraine started. So that means the father of the IGF in Ukraine is a fellow from the <laughs> from Meissen. So we, uh, the, the, the IGF in Armenia is organized by a former fellow uh, uh, from uh, our uh, school, uh, we had fellows from Georgia and from, from other countries which are not really, you know, which would not be able to uh, afford a participation in the summer school, but we were able to reduce the barriers and to allow them to participate. Yeah, that's interesting. A um, little bit of history note. Um... The Americans, when, when during this uh, during the Second World War, they had a number of POWs from Germany, and one of the things they worked with with people who were receptive to learning about democracy and concepts of of pluralism, uh, and so they they actually taught uh, to a number of these POWs uh, con pr principles of democracy and consensus and in political processes. And so they actually, just like what you were saying from the former Soviet Union, they actually uh, didn't go to the masses. They looked at, at individuals who were receptive and intelligent and, and they were proactive to, to make a difference. So I can, I can see the model that you're taking. And, and I'm not critical at all. I, I think there's a room for uh, everybody in this space and, and some people that are level entry at which in many cases, in, in our case, and then they move up the ladder and they become successful and they become policymakers. And eventually they're at the stage where uh, moving towards getting, getting a course like you guys have been delivering would be actually an icing on their cake. So, which is, I think there's a lot of room for, and especially if people move through their, their uh, courses in their own country. And that's another thing is perhaps people who did their course, did courses with you guys, and you mentioned Olga, but there must have been other people that after the experience where you guys are, they've went and, and tried to start a school or maybe involved with the local IGF. I suppose that's something else that that's a success story as well. Yeah, look at Satish Babu. So he was a fellow in our, in our uh, uh, school in Meissen a couple of years ago, yeah. and he was inspired and created 
uh, uh, his own uh, 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 summer school now. So uh, that means uh, in so far we see um, that one of our early missions to uh, be uh, to become a source of inspiration for others, you know, <laughs> has been fulfilled. And so this is, uh, we are very proud that uh, we see the, now the mushrooming of this. As I said, you know, you can compare with the first regional and national IGFs. So I was involved also in this process. So uh, the, the, that means the initiative to start a regional IGF uh, came out, you know, when I was sitting with uh, the, the former French cultural minister Krautmann in a plane coming back from the second IGF in Rio de Janeiro, and we discussed what Europe could do. And the idea was, you know, we have to create a European IGF. And this became, you know, after we left the plane, it was for the clear, we have now to uh, establish a, a regional IGF. The global IGF once a year is not enough. And what you see now is hundreds of national and regional uh, IGF uh, has uh, more than 100 has, has emerged and Eurotech is a, a big success story. So I think this is um, uh, with the experience you have over the years, it means start small, think big, move fast. So I think this is, this is what we do. Now, my final comment, because we're wrapping up in time, uh, this discussion is, is taking place where you know, you have a resurgence of COVID in Germany right now. Uh, what's going to happen in 22 for you guys? Um, I think that's, for me, at least rather clear. Um, I don't think COVID will be much of a difference than it was the past two years. I mean, we had 2020 and we had now 2021. The situation was in, in Europe almost the same in uh, the northern summer and in, in, in some of the numbers go down and uh, certain things are possible. Um, we have uh, certain security measures, we have a sort of vaccination. So if you could do it in 2020 and if you could do it in 2021, I'm pretty uh, convinced that we can do it in uh, 2022 as well. And um, basically what we've experienced in terms of keeping um, the, the hygienic standard in, in our lecture room among the fellows basically had not only or to even to a great extent, I would say, a positive impact because we reduced a little bit the number of fellows, which was beneficial. We have not too many faculties. We rather ask faculty members to give uh, uh, more lectures, not only one. That means we need to have faculty that uh, is uh, multiple usable. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Sure. Uh, this gives this gives fellows then also the opportunity to get to know them a little bit better um, compared to when they can only listen to them for forty five minutes. And then uh, we reduced the time that we uh, stayed in behind closed doors. So you see, we have this nice little courtyard. We do many sessions outside without a computer, just discussing, no presentation. And um, this was uh, rewarded in our feedback uh, that we got as, as, a, as a great achievement that basically um, the, the focus was on interactive discussion and not uh, presentations in, in a closed room. And basically this was also um, a measure that we took uh, with regard to COVID, what we will basically keep. We have to find a way to come back to the multi-stakeholder role play because as Wolfgang said, this was uh, really a beneficial exercise for the fellows um, and in particular sitting until late at night uh, and negotiating the, 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 the point and the comma uh, in, in one paragraph. Um, this is an experience that one should take. We have to see if this can be back next year. If not next year, I'm pretty sure that at some point uh, the crisis, the pandemic crisis, uh, will be uh, will be uh, finished. And even I was also very lucky to get enough international fellows uh, because I was looking for exchange fellows that are already based in Europe and that uh, were vaccinated that had not uh, so much travel involved and all this. So it was even possible to get uh, fully international groups with fellows from India, from Latin America, from North America um, and, and Africa as well. 
uh, in these two years of, of, of challenges because many of them are based within uh, the European region as well and that, that helped quite a lot. Okay, very, thank you, Sandra. Uh, any final comments, Wolfgang? Uh, yes, I think uh, Sandra mentioned that uh, we moved a lot of the uh, sessions also outside. And if you look into the uh, yard of the old monastery, so we have uh, three or four nice places where we can meet in small groups. And so we had this year the new appointed cyber ambassador from the German Foreign Office. And so, and then uh, we had these small groups, four or five people discussing with the faculty member. And then they are changing. So one hour, one group, and then they change the group, go to the other faculty member. So, and to have this very personal uh, discussion, you know, with. Uh, um, uh, uh, people from, uh, from government or from the private sector. We have manager from uh, the Deutsche Telekom uh, and from Siemens who is responsible for this charter of trust. Uh, so that means if you have these people, uh, not only as presenters in the lecture hall, but in a very small, nearly private discussion, this has a deep impact. And although it uh, gives the student, it uh, gives the fellow, we, we avoid uh, the, the language student, we say these are fellows, so these are not, not uh, classical students. So this gives them also an, 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 uh, a feeling that uh, they are taken very seriously and they are operating on, on an equal level. So that means with their special field of expertise, exchanging um, expertise which has uh, somebody else. So that means um, this um, uh, feeling of um, we are all equal. Uh, we have uh, different approaches and different perspectives. So I think it's, it's also very important and creates uh, also this very special spirit of Meissen, uh, which has really contributed to something like community building over a longer time. So we have an alumni association uh, and, and have a list where people uh, stay in contact. And as Sandra has said, you know, this went far beyond uh, a, a theoretical discussion about internet governance and have created friendship and even marriages. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, <laughs> hopefully not divorces, but marriages. <laughs> hey, folks. Okay, thank but, but new children, new children. So we have already <laughs> two babies. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll share this one on the uh, playlist and uh, get it to those. Uh, I'm not sure what, uh, Sandra, I'll turn to you. Uh, are we doing any session at all with the DC Coalition of Schools of Internet Governance at the uh, IGF Poland? Yes, we do. And apologies, I should have been better prepared to tell you when this is going to take place. I don't think I will find it right away, but indeed it is on the uh, program of the IGF to have a dynamic coalition meeting on schools on internet governance. And possibly worth mentioning is that uh, this dynamic coalition will be the first that uh, enters into an official cooperation with the IGF secretariat, right. because um, the IGF secretariat is not only asked uh, or uh, is not only the first point of contact for national and regional uh, IGFs, um, but meanwhile, many people that are not so much familiar with our internet governance community also contact the IGF secretariat when they are, have questions how to establish a school on internet governance or uh, how to join a school on internet governance. And uh, I think this could be a very fruitful cooperation but um, we have to make clear that um, we understand the distinction between national and regional IGFs and schools on internet governance. One is uh, exchange and it's, it's a conference style and the other one is a knowledge transfer. And sometimes the organizers are the same people. And, uh, but I think in most of the times, organizers of a school on internet governance is a different bunch of people than the organizers of a national and regional IGF, and right. uh, this is sometimes mixed up uh, as being more or less the same. No, it's not. There is a difference, but of course um, there is a cooperation and there's a, a, a topical on the. Yeah. So if you have that information, I'll add it to the um, the notes in the. Uh, 
YouTube video that we'll send around. So thank you both very much. Uh, it's been a while to, to organize this call, but it was well worth it for all of us, I believe. And we'll share it as soon as I finish uh, the compilation and uploading it to YouTube. So thanks again, both of you. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, yeah, okay. thank you, Glenn, for taking this approach of recording all these videos. I think that's a really great initiative. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, the um, you know quite a range of an approach because some schools are going for accreditation. Some schools have you know huge assignments. Uh, you know, uh, very very interesting to see the different approaches. There is no one model. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So great. Okay. All the best folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.